manager for Mixmaster. Previously, he was a software engineer for PGP Security, the provider of the world's best known personal cryptography software. He's a frequent contributor to online discussions in electronic privacy issues and has contributed to the development of free software privacy activities. Today, Len is going to talk about forensic dead ends, tracing users through anonymous remailers. Len? Good morning. I'm going to talk a little bit today about anonymous remailer abuse and what to do when you have to deal with a case of abuse through remailers. I'm going to start off by discussing what anonymity is. When we talk about anonymity on the network, we mean that it does a few key things. It protects the identity of the user conceals anything which might give clues as to who the user is. It separates the user's actions from their true identity, their real name. Anonymity itself doesn't hide the fact that these actions are occurring. If somebody's posting a message about a certain topic, that message is seen by everybody, or possibly seen by everybody. Anonymity does not hide that. The next issue is why anonymity is a good thing. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Is that better? People use remailers for a variety of things. There's whistleblowing, um, discussion of personal or taboo issues. What's personal and taboo varies greatly from location to location. In the US, there's quite a lot we can talk about in California that you can't talk about in Alabama. Um, in other countries, it's not just uh, the risk of being ostracized for talking about taboo issues. Um, you face anything up to stoning and death in certain, uh, certain countries just for talking about certain things like sex. Journalistic correspondence. Often somebody has something to say and they want to get it to the press. They don't want their real name involved for any number of reasons. That's tied in closely to whistleblowing. Spam protection. You may want to hide your email address because you don't want it to end up on the latest and greatest Viagra resellers list. Future anonymity. Sometimes what we're saying today may be perfectly fine, perfectly legal, not at all a concern, but you don't want it to be known that you said this at a possible point in the future. Who knew that when you were posting the Usenet in 1985 that 2002, you would be able to pull it up on Google. I bet there's people in the audience for them. Posts to Usenet that they wish they could take away. Political speech. There are a lot of places where criticizing your government is not legal or is highly frowned upon. Even here in the U.S., with the current political climate, disagreeing with the government is not a very favorable activity. Censorship avoidance. If you have something to say and you've been told you cannot say it, you risk punishment or criticism if you violate that. If you're anonymous, presumably you won't be discovered as having been the one who said these censored words. People operate emailers for similar reasons. They believe in the right to anonymity. They understand the necessity of the email network. It's great to support anonymous speech. It's wonderful to 
cheer on civil liberties organizations, but if no one's actually running systems which provide anonymity, it's not going to be there even if people have the right to use it. Certainty of an uncompromised email. I'll get to that a little bit more later in the presentation. But there are personal benefits to somebody who runs a email because they know that they can trust themselves. And it's an opportunity to exercise applied cyberpunk technology. There's a lot of research in cryptography and privacy systems, but it's one thing to discuss theory and it's another thing to actually go out and do it. It's cool. There's corporate uses for anonymity. Research of competitors. For anonymity systems like web proxies. You are snooping around your company your competitor's website. You may not want them to know that you've been there. You, know, you don't want your IP address to show up in their log. Um, you don't want them to know that you're curious about what they're doing or that you're interested in the product of theirs. Um, that ties in with avoidance and information. There are a lot of a lot of problems with electronic communication currently, and one of the big ones is we don't really, as users, know what information is being sent out on the internet. Blocking that and explicitly allowing only the information we want is a way to prevent things we don't want from being inadvertently released. Forcing industrial espionage. If, for instance, you're part of a company that's doing R&D on a new product and you have to discuss this or aspects of this new product um, or areas of that research in public forums, you may not want to tip off that your company is doing this. If you do it anonymously, then your competitors know, well, somebody's asking these questions, but they may not tie it in with your company. Employee feedback. This is one that I was a little bit surprised about that I hadn't thought of. Um, back in the days before email and intranets, most companies had comments boxes in the uh, break rooms where you could leave feedback about company policies or voice complaints without having to worry about your job being on the line. Memos have pretty much disappeared from the office. And there are now some companies that are having anonymous write the CEO web pages on their intranets. Air Products in Pennsylvania is one of them. So it sounds great. Where do I buy it? Commercial anonymity is a difficult prospect. It's really hard to sell anonymity services. There's a lack of payment collection. If you pay for an account with an anonymity provider, you're giving up your name and your credit card and your mailing address. We don't have a system of anonymous digital cash, and I'm betting we won't ever have a system of anonymous digital cash. Cost of operating services. Running anonymity systems is expensive. That's been the downfall of one major anonymity service already, and it's probably been the reason many others haven't started. The need for a large anonymity set. Is that better? The need for the need for a large anonymity set. If you're the only person using an anonymity system, there's one user. You're not very anonymous. Likewise, if the users number in the fives or tens, it's not going to be too hard to figure out which one of these users is the real anonymous user. Uncertain demand. Companies have a hard time getting funding, have a hard time justifying operating these services because there really is not that clear a demand from the general consumer public. 
legal restrictions. There's potential liability issues that you'd have to work out if you're operating a company uh, that provided anonymity services. Assuming that you worked through all that, you still have abuse complications. You have to be set up to deal with potential abuses of your system. You're not storing the identities of your users. That's the whole point of your system. So how do you handle when people abuse it? Likewise, buying anonymity, subscribing to anonymity services is very difficult. It's hard to pay for it. Again, there is no way of anonymously giving money in an electronic medium. Most easy to use anonymity systems involve a trust us system. Anonymizer is one of those. You use their web proxy and you believe, because they're staking their reputation on this, that they're not keeping logs and they're going to hide your identity. You have no real assurance that this is as strong as you'd like it to be. You have no real method of telling how strong it is. Availability of service. If there are restrictions on what you can access through this, this system, say it's a web proxy, that doesn't provide Java, or a network anonymity system that doesn't allow you to chat on IRC, it may not suit your needs. Also, if you have no guarantee that this system's going to be around next month or next year, it's hard to start basing your operations or depending on this system. Local network restrictions. It's wonderful if there's an enemy system on the network, on the internet, but if you are behind a government firewall in an oppressed country and you can't access it, then that's not going to do you much good. Ease of use. This is the reason why it's hard to sell. It's the reason why people don't want to buy it. Most computer technology is not as easy to use as it should be, and privacy enhancing technologies are very bad at being easy to use. I'm going to briefly go over some of the types of anonymity on the net before I get into remailers. Um, I divide them into two classes. It's really a grayscale. There's weak anonymity, which provides protection from the casual attacker, somebody who's not willing to put too much effort into finding out who you are. Spam avoidance. Hiding your email address, that can be as simple as putting the words no spam into your, into your uh, domain name. Anonymous online forums. Anonymous cowards on Slashdot. Craigslist. Strong anonymity. Ideally, strong anonymity would provide protection from your ISP. I don't know how many board systems we have in the audience here, but some of you have read your customer's email, you know who you are. Protection from government monitoring. You don't want Big Brother watching you. Protection in the case of server compromise. An anonymity system is running, they don't keep any logs, they're hiding your identity, and somebody hacks into the system. What can that person do? If they can then compromise your identity, it is not a strong anonymity system. Free webmail accounts, hotmail accounts. That's a form of weak anonymity that serves many people's purposes. SSL anonymous proxies, such as Anonymizer. Anonymous ISPs, now we're getting grayer. Used to be back in 97 or so, you could walk up to your local neighborhood ISP and pay for an account in cash. It's still possible, it's harder to find them since they're all being bought by Earthlink, but. Um, you could sign up for your free AOL minutes and try that every three months. There's Anonymizer, which also specializes in accepting money orders without names attached to them. Anonymous mail relays. This can be this can mean a couple of things. One, it can be open relays, which spammers tend to use. It doesn't really hide your identity all that much, but it obfuscates it. You end up with more headers in there that don't need to be there. Um, also, anonymous mail proxies. 
mail is sent to a server which strips off the old headers and forwards it on. The person who gets it looks at the headers and they can't tell who it came from. Then there's MixNet remailer systems, which are a fairly strong anonymous mail system. I'll describe them more in a minute. I can't talk about strong remailers without talking about a weak remailer, but the most popular remailer ever, anon.pennant.fi. Anon.pennant.fi was run out of Finland. It was an, actually it was a NIM server. Uh, people would register with it, give their real email address. They would be assigned an anonymous address that was anon1234. And any mail sent to that address would be then forwarded back to their real, real address. And they could send mail out through the system and their real identity would be stripped out. The problem with this is you have a list of all of the anonymous IDs corresponding to the real email addresses. Concurrently, a system known as the Cypherpunk remailers were developed. They were based on a paper by David Chom, which described MixNets in detail. I will discuss that more in a moment as well. Cypherpunks was a partial implementation of this. It was not nearly as secure as the original paper and not nearly as secure as Mixmaster remailers. There is another unrelated system, Zero Knowledge Freedom Mail, which unfortunately isn't operating anymore, but that was basically POP3 services over onion routing. Um, Roger, who's speaking after me, will discuss that more. You can ask him all about ZKS and other onion routing like systems. And upcoming is MixMinion, which Roger is speaking about at DEF CON, which improves greatly upon MixMaster. Mechanics is strong enemy. I'm not going to get too technical with this. Roger is going to get deeper into it. I want to get to the uh, abuse issues fairly quickly. I mentioned David Chom. David wrote a paper in 1981 that described a system of sending and receiving mail anonymously. It had a couple key aspects. There were multi-layered multi encryption chains where you would encrypt to one remailer, then encrypt that encrypted message to another remailer, encrypt that encrypted message to another remailer, and they would be sent out, and the encryption would be stripped off layer by layer until the final message was received and delivered. The distinguishable message packets, one of the key features of the MixNet system is that all of the pieces of mail going through it have to look the same. If they look different, even if they're encrypted, you can determine which message is which. If they get smaller as they get further along a chain, you can trace them. Random reordering at each hop mail came in to one node and did not necessarily exit in the same order it came in. It was mixed. David also discussed a system for return addresses. I'm not going to talk about that too much today. Mixmaster does these things. It is an implementation of Mixnets with clients available for Windows, Macintosh, Unix. The servers run on Unix and Windows. It does not take up too much hardware requirements. You can run it on a 486 or slower. You need a reliable network connection. You can't run it off of a dial-up system that's only up every once in a while. The system needs to be able to respond to requests all the time. And you need to have a mail server available. So let me describe how the MixNets work in a little bit more detail. This here is a picture of a MixMaster packet. You all have this in your books, so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Um, a user pulls up MixMaster, composes his message, determines who's going to receive it, and then picks a chain of remailers. He can do this either by keeping a list himself and periodically testing whether the remailers are up, or he can 
pull up a stats server which does that for him. Stats look something like this. You see the names of the remailers on the one side and their uptime on the other. Messages are then encrypted to each hop individually, with the encryption being layered on top of the previous one. If the message is larger than a certain fixed size, it's broken, it's split into separate messages. If it's smaller than this fixed size, which is 10K for the message, it is then padded out so it actually Okay, let's try this again. It's padded out so that it actually meets that fixed size. So when messages are sent, you can't tell the difference between any of them. The message is then, picture this as though it's an envelope inside of an envelope, inside of an envelope, inside of an envelope. It's sent to the first hop, the first envelope is removed, the package is pulled out, and that node or that remailer looks at it and says, oh, this is addressed to another remailer. Forwards this message on. Wash, rinse, repeat until you get to the end message which is delivered to the person it's addressed to. If there was an entity which could observe all the traffic on the internet all the time and analyze it constantly, but could not see what was going on inside of these nodes, what they would see is messages, all the fixed size going in and out, in and out of this network all the time. They would notice individual users sending encrypted messages into the system, and they would notice individual users receiving unencrypted messages, or possibly encrypted if you use a separate encryption program, coming out of the network. They wouldn't have enough data to correlate who was sending what to whom, as long as there is enough anonymous users in the system. Um, it's very important, as I said before, that you have plenty of other anonymous users using the same type of anonymity system. If you're the only person sending, and you're only sending to a certain few people, the gig's up, even if we bounce it around through 100 different remailers. If an all-seeing observer can watch all the traffic, they'll be able to correlate input and output points. Mixmaster uses cover traffic. I'm going to get questions at the end of... Um, oh, what was it quickly? Well, yes. If you're, I'm going to handle questions at the end. Okay. Um, I want to get through this quickly. I'll come back to you. Cover traffic. Remailers and users have the option of generating dummy messages, which are sent into the system uh, from time to time, that do not get delivered to anybody at the end of the chain. They're just discarded. There is question as to whether this actually gains anything. Um, more research needs to be done with that. There are potential flaws in Mixmaster, many of which are being corrected in Mixminion. There are flooding attacks, which we try to pre protect against, but do not do completely. If you're able to flush a node with messages you can, you can have sent that you know are yours, and are able to push through messages of your target, you can then watch all the traffic and know and, fo and follow your message, your, your stream of messages, in addition to the one of your victim, and know that he has sent this. Um, Mixmaster has no built-in forward secrecy. If somebody obtains the remailer keys for all the remailers, and they have a data dump of all the network traffic, they could go through and unwrap all of the encryption. Mixmaster is not nearly as reliable as we'd like it to be. We need the nodes to be up 
all the time or else mail gets potentially lost. And there are many problems with, uh, with actually keeping remailers running. Um, ease of use. The interface on Mixmaster is not horrible, but not all that wonderful either. Mixmaster has no return address capability. You can send anonymous mail, but there's no way for people to reply to you. They can reply by doing things like posting messages to your attention to a Usenet Dropbox or putting it up on a web page, but that's not part of Mixmaster. So I'm going to briefly show you an installation of Mixmaster and where some of these things sit. So when I talk about them later, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, we're going to discuss the where the program sits, how mail is handled, how the packets are handled, what could be logged, there was logging, and how abuse is processed. So when you install Mixmaster, it's dumped into a Unix directory. You've all seen this before. There's a binary mix program. which has a very simple interface. You can create mail to be sent off to somebody. Create your chain by selecting from the list of remailers. What's that? Is this really unreadable? talk then. Um, as I was going to say, you create that chain, send the message out. The person sees an email address that corresponds to the remailer after the, the exit hop after it goes to the chain. There is in that message information in the headers that says if you're receiving something that's abusive, you can follow this link or send mail to this address for instructions on how to deal with this. Um, that is answered by an autoresponder which gives information on blocking yourself from receiving more mail. Um, okay, I'm going to discuss poss uh, possible types of abuse that users may have to deal with. I talk about this and the first thing people ask me about is, well, don't people spam through it? That's apparently the most heinous abuse on the internet today. Remailers are not really suitable for spam. There's high latency. Most spammers use Dropbox return addresses from throwaway dial-up accounts. They get shut down fairly soon after they send out spam. If you're using remailers, your messages are not going to be delivered all at once. They're not going to be delivered for at least a few hours, possibly days. Spam floods are pretty easy to detect in Mixmaster. We have systems in there to pretend, protect against flooding attacks, so that catches spam as well. Open relays are much better suited for sending spam if you're a spammer. Um, all of those things don't apply to Usenet spam. If you're just posting one message to Usenet, you get a large audience with one shot, and we don't see it coming. Um, so that is still a problem. The next thing people talk about is piracy. That's not really been an issue with Mixmaster. Most remailers block any binary transfers. When you're sending very large multi-packet messages, as you were saying, um, it's fairly easy for somebody watching the network to know that you are the one sending this if, if you're the only person sending 10 megabyte files. Email is a poor medium for file transfer. You can lose packets. You can have problems with things being garbled. 
And as far as I know, the wares traders out there are still using their throwaway shell accounts, IRC, and Nutella, and whatever else, uh, whatever other peer to peer systems are running today. The type of harassment that law enforcement officers and abuse desk people and ISPs are going to face mostly is targeted harassment. Somebody who's receiving abusive messages directed at them for a reason. If there's also um, attacks on their mailbox accessibility, denial of service attacks by flooding their mailbox. If somebody tries to do this through one remailer, we'll probably see it. If they try to do this across 40 remailers, with only a few messages coming from each remailer going to the same mailbox, they'll get the same effect. But it will be harder for the remailer operators to detect. The biggest form of harassment that I see is Usenet flames. Somebody calls somebody else's mother some ugly name. They get responded to on Usenet. Somebody else jumps in and they hide their name and they flame them anonymously and this bothers people. It apparently violates the code of abuse ethic on Usenet to hide your identity when you're flaming. Um, after September 11th, I got a lot of calls from reporters and there was a lot of hype in the media about um, how remailers were going to be aiding terrorists. And this is, in my opinion, not true at all. Um, but these bits of mail, uh, these Reporters wrote in their articles that remailers were being shut down and there was going to be an imminent demise of anonymity on the internet. And what did we see but an increase of almost double the number of operating remailers. People want anonymity systems and if they feel that they're going to be threatened, then they're motivated to act. Anonymity is not entirely a warm and fuzzy thing right now, especially in Washington. We want to be able to track and trace everybody, but honestly, that can't happen even if we don't have anonymous remailers. I'm going to jump to the last bullet point here. What about public libraries? As most of you know, the word that we have on the September 11th terrorists is that they organized all their correspondence over the internet from public libraries and public access terminals. Obviously, if we can't stop them when they're doing that, shutting down remailers is not going to help. However, because remailers provide the assurance that you're anonymous and that your identity is going to be protected with more than just the word of a company, you may find that tipsters would be more willing to communicate with you if they know that they can do so anonymously. Perhaps people that are involved with suicide bombing organizations aren't too worried about being killed, but if the threat is that your whole family will be murdered, you may not want to speak up unless you can do so with assurance that your identity will never be known by anyone. So what happens when you get abuse? How do you deal with this? Well, coming and taking the remailer and analyzing it isn't going to help you much. You can't get any information out of it. If you're coming after the keys, well, they're not going to do any good because you probably don't have the message as it was encrypted before it hit that remailer. And even if you do, when you unencrypt it, all you get is the message you already have. Um, there's generally no logs. Even if they are, they only tell you what remailer the exit remailer previously received the message from. You would have to go walk back through all the chains and find out all the messages that had ever been sent to the remailer network, and that just becomes logistically impossible. Well, you say, what if you are able to watch all the traffic on the network? If you put a carnivore, or whatever it's called now, box next to every single remailer, dumped all the data that was out of there, and then went and seized all the remailers and decrypted the keys. That's going to be pretty hard. We have remailers in 
Germany, in Italy, England, there's one in Holland, there's one on this rusty oil platform in the North Sea, um, I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, fortress. So it's going to be difficult to observe all of that. And even if you could watch all the traffic going in out of all the remailers, you still have the reordering going on inside each remailer. So the black box problem presents itself. Flooding is not going to help you after the fact. The flooding attack involves pushing all the messages you control, plus one you don't, to reach the node. So you can watch that one message. If you're dealing with an abusive message, you can't turn back time and try this attack. Even if it's going to help at all, we have ways of preventing against severe problems with that index master. You could set up a honeypot remailer. This won't help after the fact as well, but if there's ongoing abuse, you could run a remailer yourself. However, that's not going to help you much unless the user is only using your remailer in his chain or is only using remailers you control if you're operating more than one in his chain. If he's using other remailers that are secure or not owned by you, then you're not going to be able to find out who he was. Well, if yours is the first hop, you know that there is... He said, unless yours is the first hop. And that doesn't help either. Because then you know that somebody is sending messages, but you don't know who he's sending them to. Chain manipulation. Well, if you're setting up honeypot remailers, and you have five of them out there, and you know that if you get your victim to use all of these remailers and none, none of the other remailers in his chain, you've got him, you could manipulate the statistics so that he will pick all of your remailers. If he's doing pinging himself, picking based on reliability, you'd have to run a very reliable remailer and degrade the others. If he's relying on statistics servers, then you could intercept the statistics information when it's sent to his machine and modify it to reflect better statistics for yours. Not very foolproof. Side channel linkage. If this person is composing his messages in an HTML composer and has specific tags describing what operating system he's using when he's sending his encrypted messages, then you know some information about it. If he leaves his .sig attached to his messages before he sends it, you know information about it. Those aren't problems that I can solve at the Mixmaster level. The real, the real surefire way of finding out who's sending abusive messages is good old-fashioned investigative police work. If somebody's receiving abusive mail, it's probably somebody they know, somebody they've pissed off in the past, somebody who has an interest in them and is stalking them. Who are your suspects and what are their motives? And then there's the ever-popular literary forensics. People write messages in unique ways. They have specific grammatical tics. They have styles of writing which are fairly unique to them. If you have suspects and you have samples of their writing, you can narrow them down by looking at other things people have, these suspects have said in email in the past. Well, what if your issue is not how to find out who was sending abuse, but how to prevent future abuse? Individuals who are receiving abuse messages have the ability to instruct individual remailers not to ever send them any more mail. There is, that works only for each individual remailer. They'd have to do it for every single remailer. There is a remailer-wide abuse blacklist, which most remailers participate in, where a user can add their name to this blacklist, and no remailers will ever send them mail. Of course, the sender does not know that his messages aren't getting through. They're just being discarded at the end because the end remailer has no way of telling the sender, hey, I didn't deliver your message because the end remailer does not know who that sender is. Local filtering. If you're just getting annoying, immature Usenet flames, 
you can set your, your email client not to read those messages. They still get delivered, you still receive them, you don't see them. In order to block people who are being abused from receiving abusive mail, we don't need to know who's actually doing the abuse. We just need to know who's being abused and prevent them from receiving that abuse. Ways to avoid being a target of abuse. Well, as I said before, Usenet Flames are the largest source of abuse that I see, or at least abuse complaints that I see. And perhaps not participating in flame wars would be a way not to receive abuse. If you're going to, protecting your identity, using remailers yourself, will prevent you from receiving abusive messages. There are spam and flood detection tools for remailer operators, which if anybody's interested, I'll talk about in the question and answer period. So, let's suppose you've received an abusive message and you want to go talk to the enemy provider, the remop, and say, who sent this? Well, what can he tell you? If he's running a system of weak anonymity, like anon.penit.fi, he could tell you who sent it. Penit had a list correlating all of the users with their anonymous uh, email addresses. And when one user decided to post some super secret high Scientology church documents to Usenet, the Church of Scientology sued and the operator of Pennant was forced to hand over the identity of the person who had sent it. He shut down Pennant because he was afraid of this continuing to happen. He was afraid that he could not provide anonymity to his users. If organizations in other countries can convince your government to hand over your users' information, you don't know if they're ever going to ask you to hand over information which you believe should not be handed over. Remailer operators, first and foremost, generally do not keep logs. I get a lot of mail on my remailer. It uses up, it, logs would use up a lot of disk space. It is not good for my disk to be writing that much data all the time. I don't want to have, I have actual email users on my account, as, on my system as well, and I don't want their accounts showing up in a subpoenaed log of emailer user information. It drags them into something they don't need to be dragged into. And it's not useful for abuse investigations. All that logs would say is that this message came in at this time from this other remailer. And it would not, you would not be able to correlate input and output, just as if you are watching the traffic on the network. You wouldn't be able to correlate input and output. But what happens if you go and seize a remailer? I already talked about most of this. Um, the points I didn't hit were the start TLS forward secrecy. I mentioned that Mixmaster does not have forward secrecy built into it. Most mail transfer agents these days have the ability to set up an SSL connection to other mail servers and use a one-time key for encrypting that. So if the remailers in, your, in the chain are doing this, those keys don't exist anymore, so you wouldn't even be able to try and, and decrypt them to analyze it. There is a future compromise potential if you were not to seize the remailer, but instead to break in and modify the Mixmaster software to start storing information that would be helpful to you. But again, this would only really help if you had all of the remailers that an individual user was using in his chain. Well, when you get abuse that you think might be from a remailer, it might be a good idea to find out what exactly the service is. Is it a system like Pennet, where the remailer operator actually has the information? Is it a strong system like Mixmaster, where they can't help you even if they wanted to? Being polite and friendly to a remailer operator it's going to get them to give you this information, and that's going to speed up your investigation. If a remailer operator can't help you, there's no reason to continue yelling at him and telling him that he has to help you. You could 
pull out my toenails and I wouldn't be able to tell you who sent a given message from my remailer. It's not possible. Threatening remailer operators is not going to encourage them to, uh, to speak to you. Um, brief anecdote here. I've uh, had a couple conversations with the FBI about abuse through my remailers. And in the San Jose field office in the heart of the Silicon Valley, FBI agents apparently still believe that they don't, aren't clear on the difference between websites and um, email servers and believe that everything is logged and that system administrators are omniscient. Um, I spent about an hour trying to explain what I've briefly explained here, only to be thanked and served with a subpoena that I couldn't answer. Um, if you treat the remailer operator as though he is a suspect, that as though he is the one who would be sending abusive messages through his own remailer, um, do not expect them to answer your phone calls when you call them again. Um, that compared to experiences I've had in the Secret Service, where they understand what remailers are, um, I was very pleased when I got a call from Secret Service, and he asked me what version of Mixmaster I was running. Once I explained to him that I was operating on this remailer, he understood that I didn't have the information to provide him, and then he asked me to block the address that had been getting this, getting this abuse mail, which I happily did. Um, So I've sped up through that last bit so I get to the questions, but I think we have time now. Um, yes. Um, he wanted to ask about the legal status of remailers. That is all very gray right now. There is a lack of um, case material on this. Though there was a case that the ACLU brought in Georgia on behalf of an anonymous remailer um, that found that the uh, remailer operators are not liable for actions through the remailer and do not have to keep logs. Um, as I said, there is nothing on the books stating this is illegal, but there is not a whole lot of uh, previous law cases that determine this one way or the other. It's still being sorted out. How secure are these three minute finance stocks? Because that's what the whole point is. Do you put some time for He's asking how secure the remailers are. I believe you're asking how secure the systems are that are running the remailers? Right. Yes. Um, that comes back to how secure a system the individual remail operator is running. Most of them are based on Unix, some are on Windows. Remail operators like myself keep up to date on various security vulnerabilities and we have systems in place to monitor changes to our system. Um, I'm fairly confident that I would be able to detect if somebody had broken in and began modifying the data. Again, they would have to hit all the, all the remailers that an individual was using. But it is a problem that you have to keep in mind. More questions? Okay. What kind of forensic traces would it leave on the local system, he's asking. Again, the only remailer that you're going to know about is the exit hop, the one, the last one in the chain that ended up delivering the message. 
if you got to the individual user fast enough, assuming that they, let's even assume that the last remailer was a compromised remailer, one that you could tell everything about it. The maximum bit of information that you could know is where this message came from previously, which is most likely another remailer. In reality, however, you would know that at a given point, this message was picked out of the remailer pool, where it had been mixed around with other messages which had come in and randomly selected, stripped of its last bit of encryption, and then delivered to the address specified. You wouldn't know anything useful at all. Yes? Very good question. How many servers are there and how many messages a day are processed? There, the number of servers fluctuate pretty greatly. Um, I'm going to talk about that more in my DEF CON talk. Currently there are about 40 remailers. Um, we spiked a bit after all the media hype about remailers going away. Um, they've been slowly and steadily increasing over time. When I started running my remailer uh, two years ago, there were 13 of them. Um, we have, I think, six remailers in Germany, almost 20 in the US, and the rest are spread out over other European countries. We don't have any in uh, New Zealand or Australia. If there's anybody here who wants to run one. Um, the more important question is how many real users are sending messages a day? Because we use cover traffic, dummy messages, we don't have a really accurate way of judging that. My remailer processes about 2,500 messages a day. Sometimes it's as much as 5,000. Sometimes it's as little as 1,800. But I don't know how many of those messages are multi-packet messages, which, which were broken down to be the right size. How many of those messages are dummy messages? How many of those messages are pings, t checking the reliability of my remailer? How many of those messages are sent to the same person over and over again. I'm pretty much blind at this point. Um, if you search Usenet, you see a fair number of anonymous free mailer posts. If you look on certain mailing lists, there's a fair number of anonymous free mailer posts. And I get four or five abuse complaints per month. So if you roughly guess that one in a hundred is going to be abusive. That gets you four or five hundred messages a month through my remailer, really. Um, that was a number I put out of the air. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Len. Uh, the next session will start at 10.30. We'll see you then. Thank you.